Hi, thanks very much. And um, there's a lot of uh, interplay uh, between what I'm going to talk about and what's already been talked about. And uh, Kristen um, gave, gave a great uh, uh, example of implementation. And this uh, is a bit higher level than that. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the Intersociety Inter Society Coordinating Committee, or ISCC, uh, is uh, uh, something um, that is run out of uh, my branch, uh, in the Genomic Healthcare Branch, in the, in the Division of Policy, Communications, and Education at NHGRI. Um, and it's not specifically about pharmacogenomics, but what I'm going to try to do is, is give you some background on the organization and talk about current activities that are pertinent to uh, pharmacogenomics and also highlight some opportunities uh, where pharmacogenomics would really fit in um, quite easily into ISCC activities. Uh, so um, in the beginning, uh, so uh, the ISCC came out of a, a, a sort of pathway of steps um, that, that led to its uh, engendering. Uh, first um, National Advisory uh, Council for Human Genome Research, and then the NHGRI's Genomic Medicine Working Group, which is a working group of our advisory council, uh, and uh, the four, uh, this meeting, number four, uh, about physician education and genomics, and a uh, recommendation came out to, to leverage the uh, medical societies who are doing most of the CME training uh, in uh, in advances in, in medicine in general um, to try to um, promote genomics education and to make it easier for societies that aren't necessarily used to genomics to move uh, forward. Um, so the charge is to improve genetic genomic literacy of physicians and other practitioners to enhance the practice of genomic medicine through sharing of educational approaches and joint identification of educational needs. And um, the, the sort of methods are to facilitate interactions among professional societies. The initial focus was on uh, physicians and dentists, and it's expanded to pharmacists, nurses, uh, and uh, genetic counselors and others. So the goals, and this is basically off of the, the original documents, to gather uh, and facilitate dissemination of bef best practices and resources in genomic education and clinical care, identify advances in genomic science that will require new educational initiatives. Uh, identify needs of societies and clinicians and filling gaps in evidence and knowledge and providing effective educational efforts. Identify foundational educational needs common across professional uh, professions and specialties. Uh, so a lot of this is sort of horizon scanning gap analysis. Uh, seeking the optimal educational balance between competencies and basic knowledge, and I'll talk a little bit more about the competencies in a minute. Uh, to design short, medium, and long-term work plans with initial focus on producing tangible outcomes within the first year, uh, and uh, to assist societies in jointly and separately publishing papers of common interest. So um, the society uh, now has more than 80 members, and they're made up of professional societies, so American Academy of Ophthalmology, um, American Academy of Family Practice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it ranges from family practice to specialties and subspecialties, including genetics, uh, and, and as well as um, dentistry, pharmacy, genetic counseling, uh, and educators of those as well, so organizations that educate. NIH institutes and centers um, are also represented on the ISCC, as well as fed federal agencies such as CDC, HRSA, the VA, and so forth. Um, hospitals and health systems, so there are some uh, places like Geisinger that, and, and University of Florida that are really active in the field um, who um, are uh, participants outside of their own professional society, um, and universities as well. Um, provider education organizations um, uh, like the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics, uh, Jackson Laboratory um, efforts, uh, things that grew out of the old niche peg, for example, are also part of that. Um, uh, crediting or organizations, ACCME and ACGME, uh, specialty board organizations, including the ABMS, are all on the roster. And we've added, um, actually, in the last sort of year, year and a half, um, a number of in international um, education programs uh, to take advantage of some of the things that are going on in uh, countries with, uh, with national health services, uh, including Canada, Australia, and England, uh, or the UK. Um, and then some in infrastructure providers, people who are, are, are actually interested in uh, participating in these efforts and providing dissemination pathways, uh, um, other kinds of infrastructure, and, and uh, patient advocates and even insurers. So um, 
the uh, pharmacogenomics related members, I've just kind of went down the list of things that are really focused on that are the ACCP, uh, University of Florida College of Pharmacy, Vanderbilt um, is an is a institutional member, uh, and if I missed some, I'm sorry, but there are a number of things there. So the operations, how does ICC work? Um, it, it is run out of our, our offices. Uh, we basically provide administrative support. Um, I'm the NIH co-chair. The non-NIH co-chair is um, Ann Carty from AAFP. Uh, that's transitioning now uh, to Rich Haspel, who's a, a pathologist uh, at Harvard, um, uh, Beth Deaconess. Uh, and um, uh, so that rotates on an as-needed as basis. Uh, administrative support through our, our branch. There are no dues or membership costs. Uh, basically, if you have a, a group that is interested in participating, we'll send you some information to take to your governing board so that they'll know what the, what the cost structure is, how much, um, uh, how much commitment they're making for this, which is really very little. Uh, and then you come to us with their uh, 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 short interest letter in uh, why they think it's important that they be part of this organization, and uh, you know, generally it's it's a slam dunk. There's no problem. So um, we have one to two in-person meetings per year. The last one was in January. Uh, the next one is February 1st, 2018. If you want to make mark down that uh, that date, uh, we have monthly plenary plenary WebEx calls uh, where we have presentations. Uh, and also um, reports from people who are doing things as well as uh, disseminating announcements of, of activities, resources, things like that. Um, that call is actually today at one o'clock. So at one o'clock, I, I have to step out and I may miss some of the discussion as a result of that in order to chair that call. Um, the working groups, um, uh, are, there are a number of working groups I'll go over, uh, and they uh, occur by natural aggregation. So if there's a, a, you know, a few people that say we really wanna do this, uh, we think this is important. They can form a working group um, uh, and get a, a, an NIH chair and a non-NIH chair, and, and they're off to go. Okay. So um, this is the website uh, for the Inter Society Coordinating Committee, or ICC. Um, it's very simple. Uh, uh, so there's a pointer here. Um, www.genome.gov slash ICC to get there. We have the overview, members, uh, member list, working groups, uh, our meetings and activities, including links to all the uh, agendas and slides uh, at the meetings, uh, resources and contact information. So the working groups, um, uh, uh, there are two, uh, the first four are active working groups right now. The last four are groups that are um, on vacation or have retired because they've completed their charges. Uh, and uh, the Innovative Approaches Working Group, uh, and I'm gonna go through these, so I just don't, I won't belabor this anymore on this. A particular slide. So um, the case studies working group uh, was created to uh, create a, a template uh, for um, a, a sort of formalized case studies to make it easier for the specialty societies to create case studies that can be used in educational materials. Uh, and there were two um, case studies that were generated uh, uh, that actually are pharmacogenomics. So there are a couple of case studies there. In addition to the um, the, the template and an example uh, of its use there. So those are free and available on the ISCC website under the case studies working group page. The competencies working group was created to create uh, for, for um, uh, to to generate uh, competencies or uh, IP. Uh, let's see, I can't remember the other the other term. Uh, uh, for, for competences basically say, we don't want to treat just facts, we want to we teach just facts, we want to teach toward ability to complete something, to be competent in something in the clinic. And so um, the competencies working group worked on uh, competencies not just for physicians, but now for other, other specialties as well. Uh, and I, I you know, jumped through the competencies to find uh, these uh, that had to do with pharmacogenomics uh, from the competencies um, uh, uh, output. So there are a number of competencies that are potential targets. And the competencies are really to be used by the educators to build, uh, um, build programs, build curricula, that, and help them avoid um, gaps in their curricula. Um, the Educational Products Working Group, uh, it collects um, existing educational products, identifies resources and initiatives that could assist genomic as education efforts, and works with CASES Group to identify areas of emphasis for educational products. The, the Educational Products Working Group um, uh, has recently been morphed as with the addition of the 
um, of the international members to a global educational products group working group, so we have the input of those, uh, those parties as well. And that working group meeting is recorded and sent out to the people who are in different time zones that can't, uh, can't join uh, live with the working group meetings. Um, and there's a, uh, this uh, competency-based uh, education report from Kristen and colleagues who developed that. So um, this is a, a website called G2C2 or genomicseducation.net, Genomic, Genetics and Genomics Competency Center. And uh, this was actually developed in its initial uh, uh, forms before ISCC, but the things that sort of um, come out of the Educational Products Working Group uh, make their way to the um, editorial board of this uh, 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 resource, which is basically a clearinghouse uh, of uh, peer-approved um, genetics and genomics education resources. And individuals can go there to get, you know, find resources for themselves, but it's probably most uh, used for educators, and it, it's based, anybody can submit something, have it go through the editorial board, be approved. The editorial board has a process which um, Donna uh, Messersmith has, has um, streamlined to uh, help um, uh, create the metadata around this and, and make it really useful. And I'll take uh, uh, just a moment to, if I can make this work, to launch that. And you're not seeing that, so do I need to share that? How do I make that seeable? Hmm? Yeah. You know what? You need to spend a lot of time on. I'll talk. So, so basically, the, you, you enter here. You can enter a search phrase like pharmacogenomics in the search field. Uh, you can. Uh, so this is the website, so it's a web browser, I'm not seeing it there. You can't do that. Okay. All right. So, um, never mind. Uh, we'll get back to that. And uh, so you can enter the search terms, and I was just going to give a short demo you enter, uh, that you can narrow it down by something that's relevant for nurses. Um, there's kind of a navigation bar along the left side on the results thing, just like you do when you go to Home Depot and you're trying to find you know, uh, uh, something in black as opposed to something, in, or, you know, or a certain price range. So you can do it by competency, you can do it by um, uh, 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 nurse versus pharma, uh, for pharmacist or, or so forth. So it makes it actually really, really slick t to get into it. There's a browse topics um, thing up in the upper right hand corner, which gets you to other uh, sort of areas quite quickly. And then you can go to the competencies uh, uh, as well. Um, and, and this is what you get when you go to the competencies thing. Uh, and you can click right into the competencies maps uh, there uh, in, in, in these panels here uh, and get into uh, the details of those competency maps and then move from a competency to the resources that actually are earmarked for that, those competencies as well. So a lot of this work was done by Jean Jenkins initially, to, uh, Jean Jenkins and her colleagues initially, uh, and, and then um, Donna Messersmith has really um, uh, improved the functionality and accessibility of all of that. Um, so ISCC also has an innovative approaches working group, uh, and uh, it was uh, created to develop novel ways to teach genomics, uh, built on the highly successful training residents in genomics, or TRIG approach, uh, developed through the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. So it's an approach uh, using a flipped classroom and a small group uh, work, uh, hands-on work on re using accessing real databases, uh, and it has been then generalized um, to uh, uh, apply to other specialties, and so, for example, down here, American Society, Society Academy of Neurology, um, Jeff Vance has, has translated the same approach for neurologists and clinical chemistry, and also uh, Kieran Musanuru has done this from a, uh, AHA has done this for cardiology as well. Um, so this is a, a really good example of a way to start some, take something that's targeted towards a specific group and then use those methodologies um, and translate them to other specialties. Um, the Insurer Staff Education Working Group, oh, as I was going to say ab about that, that um, that, that, that particular uh, curriculum, as far as I know, doesn't include pharmacogenomics, although the cardiology one may have had, may have included that. I'm not sure what the curriculum is. So that's an opportunity uh, to, to uh, work something in there. Um, the uh, Insurer Education Staff Education Working Group um, set out in collaboration with Blue Cross Blue Shield Association uh, to create a webinar series. Uh, now there's 14 webinars, um, uh, 13 of which were presented to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association staff members. 
about understanding genetic testing and all the issues around that. And those are now posted for anybody to look at on the genome.gov channel on YouTube. And um, I'll point out that um, at the uh, request of one of the people in the room here, we recently added a pharmacogenomics uh, webinar as well. So that actually went live yesterday. Um, so that's there with um, Vicki Pratt from Indiana University um, having given that webinar. Okay. Uh, ISCC engagement of specialty boards working group uh, had the intent to um, engage the specialty boards and try to uh, in increase the frequency with which um, genomics is integrated into uh, board uh, requirements for training as well as for uh, the board exams. Uh, and uh, pharma that's an opportunity for, for pharmacogenomics as well. Um, the newest working group is something called Building Bridges, uh, and this came out of our last um, in-person meeting with the recognition that we had a lot of people who were, who were generating really useful um, resources, and uh, uh, other people who uh, needed, those, needed those resources or needed some kind of connection to make sure that the people who had certain skill sets or resources were matched up with those who needed them, and so this um, working group was built. So, um, that's the, uh, the bridge across the Columbia River near the mouth uh, of the Columbia River in Oregon and Washington at Astoria. Um, this is not part of ISCC, but I wanted to mention it. This is another opportunity. The global genetics and genomics community is a set of, oops, a set of um, unfolding case studies for genetics and genomics health education. So these are actually video snippets that are tied together and, and the pathway changes depending on what choices you make through it. It's really cool and we're planning to do a pharmacogenomics um, case uh, for that as well. Um, this is something that w one of the things that, that I've learned as a result of being um, uh, involved with this organization is that there's sort of this an anatomy of usable knowledge and one of the biggest difficulties in, is engaging those providers who are out there in practice and what we've learned from people who have done this and, and, the, uh, and um, a, a number of specialties like cancer who are already doing this um, in, in depth is that you can't go to them and say, we're going to, you know, come and we're going to teach you about genomics because they won't come. Uh, you need to engage at their level what's relevant for them in their practices. So there is this core knowledge and you have these multiple specialty groups around special, multiple uh, disciplines around it, medicine, dentistry, um, nursing, et cetera. Those are little triangles. And then within one of them, uh, you have um, a number of specialties, uh, each one sort of focusing on a different patient area. Uh, and that really makes it challenging. And so what we what we say is that this is where providers engage at their specialty level, and that's where you need to be able to teach them, but you need to back translate to get them those the, the core knowledge indirectly, so to speak. Um, so practitioner motivations, relevance to their practice, uh, effectiveness compared with their current methods, time neutral or better in their workflows, uh, and, and that includes insurance, insurance coverage, counseling is streamlined, data collection is streamlined, and the time that they take to learn this as well. So is there, is there an opportunity to, to find ways to teach them in very small increments of time, uh, which also brings us to the point of care education things that um, Geisinger is doing. Patient satisfaction as they perceive it and cost neutral or, or better as their system perceives it. Um, so, you know, this is something that actually came up fairly recently as a result of another initiative uh, that I don't have time to talk about, but um, uh, with respect to provider um, engagement. And we, we came up with the concept that uh, disease group focus may be sort of the way to do it as opposed to saying, let's talk about a specific test or let's talk about a specific technology. Let's talk instead about a disease group focus. And our example is about heart disease. So heart disease um, encompasses familial hypercholesterolemia, familial cardiomyopathies, dysrhythmias, and, and pharmacogenomics. And of course, it's not just the, uh, the, the clopidogrel, Okay, you guys know what I'm saying. Um, but, but also the statins and so forth that we heard about this morning. So, uh, um, so there's a lot of opportunity here for firm, firm of genomics to be fit into the education about genomic uh, 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 impacts on these particular areas. Um, and the other reason for looking at this, so the second reason for looking at this is that the me outcome measures in heart disease are, are pretty well defined, um, and that's useful. Uh, and then the third reason is that, uh, that multiple specialties actually deal with heart disease, cardiology, primary care, including pediatrics, emergency medicine, sports medicine, pharmacy, and you can go on down the list. So, so that's a kind of a different way of thinking about how we approach the provider groups um, in an efficient and effective manner um, to get to something that's relevant to them. 
So I'm going to stop there and uh, a answer questions. Yes, Mark. So Bob, we've heard about uh, the importance of engaging with end users uh, as we begin to uh, roll things out. Had the um, really interesting presentation from Steve and uh, and I think uh, other examples of how this has been important with the uh, nomenclature reconciliation uh, efforts. Um, one of the challenges, and, and you know this from my recurrent emails to you, um, is um, I see ISCC as being an opportunity to engage with those end users around specific resources that are being created. Um, things like, you know, the ClinGen website and, and I think we could imagine some of the other, uh, the Ignite site that's being set up. Because rather than showing it around to those of us that are familiar with this, uh, we really want to get that in front of people that, um, you know, we, we think are the intended audience. And so the, the, I have two questions for you, three. One is, do you think, do you see that as a role for ISCC? Do you think that the members of ISCC actually are representative? And do you think that there's any opportunity for ISCC membership to get it out to their broader membership to be able to get a broader source of feedback? And, and how might we utilize ISCC in that role if you think that that's an appropriate role? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, the, that it could be um, viewed as a way to engage the societies and the educators in those societies who are the ones that are developing their CME materials and so forth. Um, and I think that's uh, an excellent uh, concept. It's, uh, we have run into um, the barrier that most of the societies are unwilling to sort of um, take something that we want distributed and put that on their email list because they're really trying to limit the email in, um, uh, uh, stream to their uh, members to things that are they they think are really relevant or, or our society business. So um, if it's done, it has to be created through a sort of a different pathway, uh, and, uh, and and so that's a challenge. And then the middle question was. So accepting the fact that we can't just you know blast emails out, and I, I understand the sensitivity there. Are the members of the ISCC themselves? representative enough that even if we got those folks to interact with the materials, do you think that that would be sufficient or are these people more too much like us? Yeah. So um, they are not all like us. The, the people who are the most active are the ones that are like us um, uh, and, uh, and that's a, a problem. So getting, uh, and that's one of the reasons we created this sort of building bridges working group to try to bring those people, those groups that are either inactive or at least not telling us what they're doing uh, or not telling us what they're not doing uh, to the table and be able to partner to make that work. And, and the other part of that is bringing together those different parts of expertise. So we recognize that having someone who's really an adult education expert, who knows how to do adult education in different populations, who knows how to do the evaluations of that education and the behavioral changes we're trying to uh, to, uh, to make um, as part of it, as well as having uh, somebody with genetics expertise and somebody from the specialty who really knows that specialty and what people um, are going to sink their teeth into. Um, that they, We really have to create those teams and not all those groups have that team available. So we have to kind of go across specialties in order to create, create those things. Um, so uh, getting the, uh, the educators in those um, uh, especially areas, areas engaged is uh, a challenge, and we continue to work on that. So I think it would be interesting to get the other speakers' perspectives on this question, but I think let's move to the last um, talk in the session, and we can revisit this question. So the, the final speaker um, in the training session is Howard McLeod from Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, and Howard is going to talk to us about multidisciplinary approaches and training pharmacogenomics practitioners at Moffitt. <laughs> 